duty as chairman gives me great pleasure. Um, Billy, you have given us mature leadership throughout the year. You established the Ward Veterans Recognition Committee, guided us through a very busy, stimulating year dealing with an updated dog ordinance, wetlands ordinance, and a provoking budget period. The town's very fortunate to have such a dedicated citizen as you, who has volunteered for over 25 years in many different capacities. Billy gives us a historical perspective, which is the very heart of our town. He will continue on the town council for another two years, at least. I look forward to his counsel and his guidance during my term as uh, chairman. I hope that I will be able to follow the good example he has set as chairman. And it gives me great pleasure to present you with the plaque, William Jordan, town council chairman, 1989, 1990. Thank you. the agenda, I'd just like to make a little somewhat short statement, which I sort of call the state of the town. And I want to thank all my fellow councillors for the honor and privilege of being elected as chairman of the town council. Having completed my second year on the town council and having worked on the busy ordinance committee and having been chairman of the finance committee, I now look forward to completing more of the goals I set for myself during my campaign. These are to work for the adoption and implementation of the new comprehensive plan and the development of a comprehensive sign ordinance. During my term, we have recognized the need to clarify the boundaries and terms of the Thomas Jordan Trust. I hope these issues will be resolved in this next year. Other issues which have come to the forefront are the changing need and pressures upon the school department, the need to better anticipate and plan so that we can accommodate such pressures is of the utmost importance. I would like to see a school space study committee formed. The report from this group, as well as a long-term school department capital management plan, will make better use of our tax dollars. In keeping with a campaign promise to take care of what we have and to make the best of what we have, I strongly support the continued work of the Municipal Facilities Committee I also support the continued beautification of the town center with the plantings and flowers such as those at the Pond Cove Service Center, Pond Cove Shopping Center, the town hall, and our new traffic islands which are growing green grass instead of green tarmac. An att attractive town center reflects our pride in our town. I will also encourage citizens to help with the items on our special wish list. These are those special extras that make the town very special but are, and are best supplied by non-tax dollars. I look forward to working with my fellow councillors and on all of the important projects that lie ahead. I look forward to a year of positive constructive effort by all to produce a year of challenge, a year of accomplishment, a year of teamwork. Thank you. The next item on our agenda, citizens' discussion on items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who would like to come forth? Would you please come up to the podium and give us your name and address? My name is Diane Joyce. I live at 2 Fenway Road. I'm going to read you because I'm nervous when I'm up here. I respectfully ask the town council to consider a charter change to increase the number of school board members to seven when a special election to be held as soon as possible. I fear the town council, with its seven members and different interests, are able to handle every problem that arises. Since Dr. Pelletier has already been quoted in the Cape Courier as saying next year's budget will be worse if he already sees a shortage of funds for next year, because of this, 
budget process and some of the decisions made by the school board, I feel seven members are needed so the election will fully understand and have enough time to evaluate and consider the discuss and discuss before a decision aspect of the school budget prepared by the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizens who wish to come forward? <laughs> If not, I'll close this section of our agenda. And now, the fun part begins. <clears throat> this is a practice, I guess, that began about two years ago where the town council has um, recognized special efforts made by the school teams, um, either the athletic teams, the debate teams, or the um, different players. So if the um, town council, the town council would like to present to the high school lacrosse team, if you please come forward. I'm going to read this resolution. This team has come so close so many times to being the state champions, and at, at first the only public school that had a lacrosse team. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth High School lacrosse team won its first ever Maine State High School Championship, and whereas this program has made tremendous progress in earning a championship so soon after its creation, and whereas the team has served as excellent representatives of the town of Cape Elizabeth, and whereas all the citizens of our community have great pride in the achievement of the lacrosse team. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and Town Council Assembled that we hereby salute the Cape Elizabeth High School lacrosse team on their success in winning the state championship for lacrosse, dated this day, the 11th of June, 1990, at Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and it's signed by all of the town councilors. I'm uh, Charlie Birch, the lacrosse coach, and with me here tonight is uh, Chris Richards, my assistant coach, Mark Cameron, Joe Babcock, uh, Chris Root, and Troy Graham. Uh, it is exam week, and some of our players, the rest of our players, are possibly studying tonight. I can't <laughs> swear by that, but uh, that's a good excuse maybe why we're not well represented tonight. But very proudly uh, accept this, and I will turn this over to Keith Weatherby, the athletic director at the high school, and uh, we hope to have continued success in the future. Thank you very much for the recognition. Madam Chairman, uh, yes. I just might add that uh, Mr. Birch was also voted Coach of the Year. He didn't mention that. I think a round of applause uh, goes to him. Oh. And just this weekend, um, we had another championship team just in time for a presentation this evening. If the um, high school girls tennis team would come forward, or representatives of the team, Coach Betsy Hughes. We have another resolution. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth High School girls tennis team has won the main Class B championship, and whereas the team has had a perfect season with 16 victories, and whereas the team completed this feat with great adversity as their regular home courts were not available throughout the season, whereas in winning the championship for the first time since 1985, the team deserves the recognition of the entire community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the town, Cape Elizabeth Town Council and Town Council Assembled that we hereby congratulate the Cape Elizabeth High School girls tennis state champions and we thank you for representing Cape Elizabeth so well. Dated this 11th day of June, 1990 at Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And we have Gail Butler 
and Holly McNulty, Katie Blake, Sarah Newcomb, and Angie Gasper. And they've done a wonderful job, and our others that aren't here have done a wonderful job, and we thank you very much. It also has become a tradition to present to the outgoing chairman of our various boards and commissions plaques for the dedication they have shown during their um, term. Would Mary and Guthrie come forward, please? As chairman of the planning board for 1989-1990, the planning board is one of the least appreciated boards in town, but also one of the boards that makes some of the uh, most critical decisions on the development of our town. They spend many, many hours meeting sometimes two and three times a month in, on special site walks. Mary, it's a great pleasure to present this to you. <laughs> also a very critical board is the Zoning Board of Appeals. Would Peter Rubin come forward, please? Peter has been chairman of the um, Zoning Board of Appeals from 1988 to 1990. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. The Board of Health Chairman, Christine Thurber Irvin, is she here? She has been chairman from 1999-1990. We all are quite aware of many of the efforts made by the Conservation Commission. Sally Tinsman has been chairman 1989-1990. Would Sally come forward, please? Thank you, Sally. And we all receive great pleasure from the Thomas Memorial Library. Would Mary Kernan, who's been trustees chairman 1988 to 1990, please come forward. Thank you, Mary. Thank the Board of Sewer Appeals has many tough decisions to make, and William Orcott has been chairman from 1989 to 1990. Would he come forward, please? Thomas Jordan Trust Study is still in process, but the committee um, proposed a very lengthy um, proposal that w is now being resolved, we hope, by the attorneys and by the, eventually by the town council. David Wakelin led us very nicely through that whole committee. He was chairman 1988-1989. David? The Comprehensive Planning Commission has been working very diligently for three years now, and tonight we have our public hearing on the Comprehensive Plan. W. John Ameling was chairman from 1989, 87 to 1990. John? Thank you, John. The next item on the agenda is the report from the Board of Health. Is there a representative from that commission here? If not, then we will have their presentation at another meeting. Reports and correspondence. Mm -hmm. Members of the council? Any particular meetings? Jane? Uh, no, but I, I'd like to uh, just comment on uh, Diane Joyce's recommendation. Uh, that a charter change be instituted to increase the size of the school board from five to seven members. Uh, I just, there are two ways that that can happen. Uh, a charter change can be initiated by the council. In fact, the council did initiate uh, several charter changes, I guess it was two years ago now, uh, one which changed the date of the local election. Another issue discussed at that time was increasing the size of the school board, but the committee the Charter Commission review 
uh, decided not to do that at that time. And there were some other changes also that were recommended and that were changed. However, uh, citizens also can, through the petition process, uh, uh, ask for a charter change. Uh, so I don't know which route you want to go, but as a council, I would be very happy to bring that forward again uh, uh, to consider a, a charter revision for that one purpose. Uh, I do think, though, that if there were, uh, if, if there are a lot of people in the community that are interested in this, a petition process might also be a very effective way to do it and let people know that it's being considered. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, to respond to your comments and appreciate your coming forward with that suggestion. Any other correspondence or reports from members of the council? Councilor. So to follow up on what Councilor Amaro just said, uh, do you want them, I agree with what you said, do you want the council to move forward with an item on the agenda next time around or do you want to wait for to see the support from the community? Uh, I wonder if Diane has any preference or if you've talked to people in the community as to what you would prefer. I feel as though we all want it, but I think the rate speech is so, so good that it's, I guess we'll be um, sent it and vote on it, and then it goes through and we'll have to go out and petition to get changed. So what is my view to the, the right way? <coughs> well, there, there are two routes. Right. You could go out, you could start a petition and get enough signatures uh, to request that a change be put on the ballot. or the council can initiate a change if a majority of the council members vote to do so, uh, and, uh, and then the council can have it sent out to the voters. I'm not sure if we have to have a charter review committee set up for one item. I don't believe we do. So it could go either way. I just think that uh, it would probably be more effective to go the petition process because you get more people involved in the process and might have a better chance of winning in the long run by going that route than have it be initiated by the, the by the council. Oh, when whenever you had when whenever you had the petition ready, you would present it to the town clerk. Okay, so I could do that. And that and then get <laughs> <laughs> it would be important to get it uh, written up so that it's in good legal form, and I, I would suggest that you come in and talk to the town clerk tomorrow about okay. how you'd like to see it worded. Mr. McGovern, do you have anything to add? No, just again reiterating what uh, Councilor Amaro just said is it's very important the form of the petition and uh, the exact wording on it. And if, if you present uh, to the clerk the proposed draft, then we can have the, turn, the town attorney review it as to form uh, to, to make sure that it would be sufficient for the purpose intended. As long as I don't have to read anything, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Yes, Councilor I would, Jordan. I would hope that they we'd move forward with that, and if we did, we could uh, have it for the November election, couldn't we? On the ballot, have a ballot in the November election, we'd have time enough if we started now, wouldn't we? I would think so. Yes. Okay. Any other reports or correspondence? I just wanted to remind everyone that tomorrow is the June primary. It will be held at the high school from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. There is a Republican primary and a Democratic primary. Those of you who are unenrolled currently may enroll into the Republican or Democratic Party and vote tomorrow. The Board of Voter Registration will be in session um, all day, so please come um, if you would like to vote tomorrow at the high school. No other correspondence or reports, then we'll move on to item number two. To consider the adoption of town council rules and take any necessary action. Any discussion of the items? These essentially are the same as what we had last year. Councilor Amaro. Madam Chairman, I would move that the rules uh, of the cables of the town council be adopted as printed here. Second. Any discussion? We, we just need to make a bit of a uh, an, uh, an amended amended 10 11 89 amendment. Uh, we, we've doubled the uh, line here on section 11 that I think we need to delete. Is that correct, Mr. Manager? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that in, in, in section 12, chairman is indented. Uh, mm -hmm. It should be should be tabbed over when it isn't. Right. Other than those two, mm -hmm. though, I would let the motion stand. 
No further discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Opposed? None. Next item on the agenda, consider the appointment of a finance committee and take any necessary action. Madam Chairman, I move that Wayne Creelman be chairman of the finance committee and the committee consist of the whole council. Second. That was a second? Is that correct? Yes. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your hands. None opposed. Item number four, to consider the appointment of an appointments committee and take any necessary action. Madam Chairman, I would uh, move that Councillor Amaro uh, be appointed the chairman of the 1990-1991 appointments committee. And we will also add to the chairmanship uh, Mr. Carl Pearson and Ms. Rosemary Reed to the appointments committee. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Next item in the agenda, to consider the appointment of an ordinance committee and take any necessary action. Madam Chairman. Mr. Jordan. I'll move that Janet McLaughlin be the chairman and Wayne Creelman and William Jordan be the member, three member committee of the ordinance for the ensuing year. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, raise your hand. Next item, to consider the election of representatives to serve on the Greater Portland Council of Governments Executive Committee and General Assembly and take any necessary action. Council Amaro. It, was, it is with a great deal of pleasure <laughs> <laughs> that I recommend, that I nominate uh, uh, Janet McLaughlin to serve as our uh, delegate to the Executive Committee. Uh, I've, I've been in that position for four or five years now and my uh, predecessor, Penny Carson, who I think served for at least six years on Cog's executive committee, is here. So it's a great tradition, Janet. Tough I shoes wish to you, fill. <laughs> I wish you a, a, a lot of fun and a lot of, a lot of good times uh, representing us. And I'd also like to uh, uh, nominate for the Cog General Assembly, Wayne Creelman and Rosemary Reed. Is there a second? I'll second that with a comment that Councilman McLaughlin is ready for the good times that and follow up what Penny and Jane has carried on, and we want to leave it that way. We don't want her to fall back on the job. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Next item in the agenda, the appointment of a council representative to serve on the Regional Waste Systems Board of Directors and take any necessary action. Ms. Madam Chairman. Councilor Jordan. I would like to nominate from one Jordan to another, Lester Jordan, who has served on the regional waste for a number of years, and uh, I talked it over with him, and uh, he said if he had any change of mind, he'd get in touch with, with me before tonight. And uh, so I never heard from him, so I guess he's going to be elected. I'll uh, second the motion. <laughs> any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your hand. Next item, to consider an appointment to the PACS Policy Committee and take any necessary action. Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that we appoint our town manager, Michael McGovern, to serve on the PACS Policy Committee. Second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, I'm sorry, I apologize. It'll take right. a while to adjust. <laughs> okay, we're all newly appointed to the various committees. It, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's we, very Madam important. Chairman, Madam Chairman, Chairman, we miss Maine Municipal Association. We cannot not have a representative to Augusta. Oh, wait, you're right. It's I move we take an item out of order, Madam Chairman, to consider appointment. Uh, that we take an item out of order. Second. What item would you like to take out of order? An, an item to consider the appointment of a council member to the Maine Municipal Association Legislative Policy Committee. All those in favor, taking the item out of order. All right, 
to consider the appointment of a representative to the MMA Legislative Policy Committee. Is there a nominee? Madam Chairman, I would like to place in nomination the name of Carl Pearson to this committee. It's a committee I have served on for two years, have enjoyed. I find it's like going to a statewide town mm -hmm. meeting. It's a lot of fun and a good learning experience. I'm sure Carl will enjoy it. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Now we are complete with all our committee representatives. <laughs> I will open a public hearing on the comprehensive plan. That's the next item on the agenda. Um, <coughs> yes, John Ermerling, who was the um, chairman of that particular committee, would you like to make a brief background presentation? You wondered why you got your plaque first, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud to receive that award that I brought my mother along to see me here. I'll get you a I actually, I, I am very pleased that you gave that award. And there are others here who are regulars, Eleanor Redman and Larry Clough, and I don't know whether I see others out there, that we sort of had a car, uh, core group going to get this thing done. Um, and it was quite an effort to do it over time because of interest coming and going and various people of losing interest and gaining interest as the time, uh, as the time passed. I, I was really rather surprised, actually, that it was 87 when this thing started. Uh, I think that's what the citation said. <clears throat> um, I won't go into that much depth about it. We've been over this together collectively uh, and, and uh, not so collectively. I did happen to miss the last hearing on this, but. Uh, for the public's benefit, the group was set up in 1987, uh, as you know, with various members from various boards and commissions to act on an old and somewhat outdated uh, comprehensive plan. Um, we had a statutory obligation uh, at hand at the time, which we are fulfilling here, which is to adopt a plan which complies with state law because uh, uh, within the recent years, the state legislature has adopted a a requirement that we do certain things as local communities. We tended to do them before, but this process also therefore had a statutory validity to it as well. We met a number of times uh, collectively. Uh, we broke up into smaller groups. We had at least two public hearings. We took a poll, uh, which some of you in the dim past may remember, which was an interesting thing to do about community attitudes. We met with the council several times, and we did come up with a draft plan, which went its way through the approval process and got to this point. Um, the only thing I can really say in general terms about it is that um, we, we recognized at first something had happened in the Cape which caught everybody surpri by surprise. And that was in 1981, uh, everybody felt that we should go about the business of trying to protect rural areas and to conserve farmland. And we adopted a, a program which really didn't work at all uh, because what happened is we had a phenomenon of slightly increasing population coupled with uh, a rather dramatic increase in land use. And it was a troubling development that nobody really anticipated back then when the original plan was set up. So we decided to see what we could do. And part of the poll taking process in, entailed trying to find out how the community felt about itself and where it wanted to go. We ended up setting priorities. And for those of you who are not here for teachers' pay issues tonight, those priorities are set out in the comprehensive plan, copies of which have been made available. And when you read it, you should understand that when you start at the beginning, the highest priorities are set first, and they go in reverse order throughout the balance of the plan. Um, the plan is not self-executing. And one of the things that we here tonight on the committee want to ask is to make sure that the council fulfills the, the job of, of, of adopting this plan by adopting some sort of procedure to follow through and to make sure this thing works, because it, uh, it calls for a fairly aggressive strategy which requires ordinance amendments and policy changes throughout a whole host of areas, all of which are, most of which are detailed in those matrices that Steve invented and threw into the plan from one time to another. Um, in sum, what we're trying to do and what we have adopted or want you to adopt in this plan is a program which tries to realistically deal with the fact that we are dealing with borrowed property and borrowed time. And, uh, this is not rehearsed, but what I mean by that is that right now in the Cape, we're kind of counting on other people not developing open space 
in order to preserve what, what values we hold the highest here. It's not fair and it's not right and it's not going to happen unless we do something to deal with the ordinances to make the whole community work together, all properties work together to serve that objective. We are also in the midst of a recession. If people don't read the papers, uh, <laughs> don't know that. I'm sure everybody does, which means that we have time. Uh, we have time, I think, right now to address aggressively the programs that are contained in this document, and we really ought to do it. So I just close my only s short statement here by saying that um, we earnestly solicit not only the adoption of this plan, but uh, its implementation through some specific procedure with specific individuals named to some sort of specific timetable to do something, to take on the task of picking off and, and, and doing the things that are required by this plan because uh, sitting alone, it's, it's virtually meaningless right now. Penny may or may not have some comments after the way I introduced her, <laughs> but why don't you come up here and make a few comments. I have some comments, John, but I'm not going to say them. Um, I, was asked to, I was asked to speak tonight on the process that we used to get to this point, which we have, of course, spoken about at least two or three times, and I don't think there's much need to go into it. I would like to point out and to point out to the public how we arrived at the order and the priorities. And one of the things the comprehensive plan is for is to try and get the attitudes and opinions of the citizens and what they consider to be important in their life and living in, in Cape Elizabeth. So we did send out a public uh, questionnaire survey and received a lot of good responses, more than we had actually anticipated. And the, we did prioritize those interests based on the responses that we had. And then we attacked that in the comprehensive plan, starting with the number one as being the most important to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And I would, based on the rest of the agenda this evening, uh, just read what people consider to be some of the best aspects of Cape Elizabeth in the order of their priority. Number one, people like it because they live so close to the ocean here. Number two, they like to be in Cape Elizabeth because they like the community and the natural environment that is around them. Number three, they like the appearance of the physical attractiveness of the community. Number four, they like its close proximity to the core city, to Portland, where so many services are. Number five, they like the school system. Number six, they like its people. Number seven, they, have, they like and have concerns about the housing. Number eight is public services. And number nine, they think the tax rate is sort of OK. <laughs> I wanted to point that out because we needed to be led in our deliberations by the interest that the community had, that the citizens had. And we attacked this problem from that, in that direction. And it appears that the most important things to the citizens of this community, according to, this to the questionnaire and the way we have since approached this, is the physical environment of Cape Elizabeth. Not its public services, not its schools, its library, but its physical environment. That's why people come here to live. So that's what we really uh, moved along on is, is, is um, land use, as John said. Uh, it was a very long process. A lot of people played a role in it. The council played a role in it. Lots of members from organizations played a role in it. We hope to have more citizens come and speak to us, but we did have a lot of questionnaires. So we think we've done our job well, and we hope that the council will move with great speed uh, through their part of the process. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who wish to make a comment on the comprehensive plan? There being, excuse me, yes. <laughs> See, nobody that wants this, this is how you envision, this plan is how you envision <laughs> Cape Elizabeth to be in the next decade. <laughs> you tried, Penny, you did a good job. They're probably like me, and they don't understand it because you get changes every time you come up here. But when you make them, you make them. I, I didn't make them. Oh. I'm just reviewing them. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no other statements or comments from the public, I will close the public part of the hearing, and the town council will have its deliberation. Before we begin our deliberation, however, I would like to read the names of all those people who worked so long and so hard 
Besides Chairman uh, John Amerling and Vice Chairman Penelope Parson, it was Daniel Boxer from the Planning Board, Lawrence Clough from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Ann Finlayson, Carol Fritz, Edward Hollage, Lynn Jones, Alan Martin, William Nickerson, and Eleanor Redmond. Comments from members of the Council? Why, well, you waiting for me to start? I'd just like to make a, take an offhand comment and uh, also to let you know that the changes I got in the packet and what I have in front of me here tonight are different. Now, number one, what are we voting on? The ones we got tonight or the ones that was in the packet? Both or either? Or. If I may, Madam Chairman, the only thing you're voting on is, is whatever a counselor make, makes a motion. Uh, two, the uh, the dr the second draft resolution is is as a result of comments that uh, individual counselors have made uh, uh, prior to Friday or on Friday, as well as uh, over the weekend as well, and, and even uh, this morning uh, through the mail slot. Uh, you know, most of them are technical in nature, uh, but some of them are substantive, and. In, in terms of you know information you haven't really looked at before, so um, you know I would understand uh, that you'd want to carefully review them. Thank you, and I also want to thank the committee, and I think they've done a tremendous job. And uh, I know it's it's a long document, and they went through quite a process to bring it to this point, and I kind of agree with them. If we're going to adopt it, we ought to do something with it. But I. See some things in here that bothers me, and I don't know why it should bother me. I'm getting pretty old anyway, but my children might like to be thinking about it down the road. But and uh, some of the comments to me are so open-ended that anybody could take them and use them any way they wanted to. Especially when you a new criteria should be added to the variance on and conditional use criteria as follows. Adverse impact to the town's scenic area shall be minimized to the greatest extent possible and shall be reviewed through the use of the town scenic view methodology. Now, I could come up here and tell you that if you stuck up a post or two, it was going to hit my scenic view, and the next one could want to put up a garage or something like that. And, this is what bothers me. It all depends on what the people come in and want. On the new document I received tonight, no structure shall be located on any portion of the designated green belt. Now, you're, you're right up front here telling somebody where the green belt is. And it's, it's somebody else's land, but you're telling me you can't put a structure on it before he even gets started to do anything, if I understand this document correctly. Now, maybe they can help me out. I got a couple others. That but as far as the Greenbelt, Councillor um, Jordan, that there always has been a restriction that there'd be no structures on it. That, that is just being emphasized more because we're including the special wording of how we adopted the, um, the Greenbelt last year. We had special criteria. I, un I understand. But that was already essentially there. I understand that, and I think I went through it when we adopted it before, so I can't forget it. I've got to bring it up and keep going with it. I know I'm going to lose, but I'm going to let people know my thinking. And uh, somebody else might want to have a comment. I've got a couple other ones here the same way that I feel is so open-ended that anybody can come up in mass and persuade a board not to allow things done because of the way the wording is here. All I have for now. Okay, part of the wording says that we have to adopt special criteria for them to review the scenic vistas, and as yet we have not done that, which we hope to do uh, once we work on the report we receive from that special committee. Mr. McGovern? Yeah, did you want me to explain how the changes from the earlier document? It would probably take 10 minutes, but I could explain yeah. to you That's what I was where sure. they yes. came from. Okay. What? If I may, Madam Chair, what the council has before it is a is a draft resolution adopting the comprehensive plan. The first page that you have before you is no change at all. That 
it's whereas is to the effect that the committee had met and that they uh, had a had a broad uh, effort to uh, have for public participation. Uh, the second page begins begins to get into the council commenting on on different sections of the board uh, of the report. Uh, the first one uh, is is one that uh, Councilor Jordan just mentioned about uh, the the scenic space. The language had been in the, in the draft of the the comprehensive plan that there shall be no adverse impact to the scenic areas. Uh, that language in, in this proposal has been softened somewhat to read instead a new criteria should be added to the variance conditional use criteria as follows. Adverse impacts to the town's scenic areas shall be minimized to the greatest extent possible and should be reviewed through the use of the town's scenic view methodology. Again, before that said, there shall be no adverse impacts to the town's scenic areas. The second point uh, came from uh, Councillor McLaughlin a suggestion and uh, that earlier provided that when reviewing significant historic and archaeological sites that uh, it should be reviewed with the Cape Elizabeth Preservation Society. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin suggested instead that uh, the references should be to the Cape Elizabeth Board of Historic Preservation Advisors since that is the official town board whereas the, uh, the Cape Elizabeth Historic Preservation Society is an independent group. Uh, Section 3, the Green Belt, uh, the first uh, asterisk, the Green Belt adopted by the uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council on April 10, 1989 <coughs> is hereby adopted as part of the plan. The only change from the uh, earlier uh, report of the committee is that that date has been inserted. It was, it was not part. Uh, the second asterisk, the Green Belt as acquisition program should be targeted primarily to an undeveloped land and process for which new residential or commercial developments are being proposed. However, individual landowners should be contacted to ascertain their interest in assisting with impl implementation of the Green Belt Plan. The report of the committee of, or of the commission uh, provided that individual landowners could not be contacted. Uh, this would loosen that up a little bit so that they could, in fact, be contacted. Uh, the next section in the use of any public funds uh, that may be made available priority shall be given in the following areas. The Thomas Jordan Trust Fund property, access to Great Pond, and then connecting Fowler Road to the Spurrink Marsh, Lions Field to the Spurrink Marsh, Crescent Beach State Park to Fowler Road and Lions Field to Fort Williams Park. That particular asterisk was taken exactly out of the April 10, 1989 adoption uh, by the Town Council. Uh, the next asterisk, it did read the Town Council Planning Board Conservation Commission and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust should work together to achieve the goals of the Greenbelt Plan. Uh, it was suggested that uh, before the Cables Plan Trust to be added in private organizations such as uh, rather than a, a direct uh, contact. The final asterisk was in the, the report of the Green Belt Plan and it's just primarily here because it's the only one with no change and just so that, so that it has the flow and that reads no structure should be located on any portion of the, green, of the designated Green Belt. Uh, number four, uh, this came out of the council workshop discussion uh, th this provides that the town council shall prepare a strategy to maximize new public access uh, opportunities at development projects on coastal waterfront sites. The original draft provided that uh, there was an automatic requirement of new public access opportunities at development projects. Uh, this uh, softens the language instead providing prepare, prepare a strategy. Uh, the next section also came out of a discussion at a council workshop and the, the earlier, the plan provided that whenever there were existing pedestrian trails uh, in proposed subdivision and developments, that they would be maintained uh, no matter what. Uh, this one reads, when uh, new residential and commercial developments are proposed, existing pedestrian trail systems shall be preserved or relocated within the development whenever possible, and provided this requirement is not implemented in any manner that would constitute an unreasonable taking. Uh, the next recommendation, uh, in the, the section on septic tanks, it, it now is proposed to read, the Code Enforcement Office shall make regular checks of homes with private septic systems to ensure that adequate maintenance and pumping is occurring. The earlier language read, the Code Enforcement Office shall make periodic checks of homes uh, with private septic system. It's been changed from periodic checks to regular checks. Uh, the next section uh, relates to impact fees. Uh, the draft of the Comprehensive Planning Commission read the Town Council shall implement an impact fee system or, or, or language similar to that. Uh, this is proposed to read the Town Council should formally consider the development of an equitable 
legally defensible impact uh, system. Uh, the next section uh, related to deficiencies in different public facilities. It made mention of the Public Works Department and the Fire Department as having deficiencies. Uh, there was no mention at all of the Police Department, and as, as we know, the Municipal Facilities Committee has been working uh, on, uh, on the, the needs of the different departments and uh, does recognize there's some deficiencies in the Police Department. I should mention at this point, before we skip to the next page, one of the reasons why it's important to, to be specific in, in what your desires are as the Council is because the comprehensive plan does have the standing uh, as a document so that every ordinance that follows it has to be in conformance with it. So, you know, therefore, for example, if you didn't have an impact fee system, people could point toward this plan and say, your ordinances are not, are not in compliance with the comprehensive plan because you don't have an impact fee system. Uh, and there are other, you know, I think that same argument could follow through with, with all of the, uh, the different provisions. On the next page, uh, the capital improvements programming process uh, when the Council of Governments, which is the reviewing agency, looked at this plan, it decided it was not, uh, they re recommended that it was not direct enough as far as uh, provisions for capital improvements process. Uh, it's proposed to uh, add a sentence to the end of the narrative, uh, mentioning the fact that the town currently evaluates the need for major capital projects on any annual basis and has is, and is also uh, formed the uh, Municipal Facilities Committee. Within the implementation step, it's proposed to add, the town shall establish a formal community-wide capital improvements planning process. That implies that it should not only be the municipal government, but also for the school system, the sewer system, uh, the Riverside Cemetery, the other different funds other than uh, the regular municipal budget. In uh, recommendations, uh, the next two sections, recommendation 22 and 23, paragraphs 9 and 10, uh, in, in this text, uh, the Comprehensive Planning Commission uh, provided that there shall be established a uh, nonprofit local housing authority, and that uh, is, an, is a requirement. It's proposed to revise both, revise both of those sections to uh, read that the town council should consider the establishment of a uh, of a nonprofit local housing authority. Again, this would bind you to to, act, to consider it and take you know forward movement on that, but it doesn't force the council to come up with the four majority votes, uh, four votes in the majority to actually establish one. Uh, the next section, uh, Council McLaughlin pointed out that there was a uh, contradiction uh, in uh, recommendation number 24 and 25. Recommendation 24 provided that there would be absolutely no expansion of the business zone. Uh, recommendation number 25 provided uh, that there should be a design competition in the town center and as part of that design competition, uh, consideration should be given to expanding the business zone in the town center. Uh, in, in order to do away with that contradiction, it's suggested that uh, the first of the two recommendations, uh, which was limit any new commercial development to the existing business zone districts, be revised to read, limit any new commercial development to the existing business zone districts, except for the expansion of any existing businesses within the town center area. And again, uh, the implementation step uh, language would provide for that. Uh, paragraph 12, recommendation 24. Uh, there was a provision, uh, the one in the, the recommend. Me. Mr. McGovern, that's recommendation 29. Oh, I'm sorry. Recommendation 29. Uh, who knows what recommendation 24 provided, but <laughs> recommendation 29. Uh, provided that the town should undertake an analysis of all roads, including major thoroughfares and intersections, to determine their level of service using a measurement standard that relates to, it did read, the rural character of the town. It's proposed to change that to read to the character of the section of the community where the roads and or, and or intersections are, are located. Uh, that came from a suggestion of uh, Council McLaughlin indicating that Route 77 didn't have too much of a rural character to begin with. and. Uh, when we look at those roads and intersections, it, it should relate to the character of that, of that particular roadway and not necessarily, because it, it isn't necessarily a rural character, uh, some of the roads in the community. Some of them are, but I'm not going to, I won't get into a debate. Uh, paragraph 13, uh, again, when COG looked at the comprehensive plan, it noted that we did not have a section on forestry, and the state, through its growth management law, very much would like to see communities have a section on forestry. So the town planner uh, working over the weekend uh, suggested the, the following language, and I'll read it. 
it, it, this would go at the end of the land use section, and uh, the the heading would be allow commercial forestry practices where, appro where appropriate while still preserving the town's significant scenic areas slash vistas. The narrative would read, while commercial forestry is not a major economic activity in Cape Elizabeth, there are a few sections of forest land that are managed and harvested for commercial timber production purposes. Timber harvesting activity should be allowed as long as they do not result in the loss of scenic, significant scenic areas. Excuse me. The recommend, recommended implementation steps would be the town should encourage tracts of forest land to be enrolled in the state tree growth tax program. Uh, two, proper timber management practices, practices should be encouraged of all forest land property owners. Three, the town should discourage or prevent the commercial clear cutting of trees within 300 feet of the edge of any public roads right of way. Uh, and the fourth would be harvesting operations should minimize the size of clear cut openings in the forest canopy. Uh, in paragraph 14, uh, as uh, had been mentioned, Steve Butler had uh, did a very uh, good job preparing uh, a number of uh, implementation matrices that appear throughout the uh, entire comprehensive plan. Uh, it was noted in that that even though Steve tried to make it uh, quite complete, we, we do have a number of other committees uh, that, that ought to be involved in the process. Uh, in addition, uh, there was some, some staff input that, that uh, could have been added to it, as well as the town council and uh, its ordinance committee. So it's uh, recommended that uh, the first sentence of that section uh, in your, your draft motion uh, read that the, the implementation matrices within the plan need to be made more inclusive in terms of town council staff and board participation. Uh, the next sentence is uh, coming out of the language of uh, the draft you had beginning last Wednesday. The town council shall prior to November 30, 1990 prepare a more specific strategy and timetable for the implementation of the comprehensive plan. Uh, paragraph 15 is the same and the last page is the same. So those, those are the changes and again, uh, all of those were made uh, at the suggestion uh, of the council workshop at the suggestion, as well as some at the suggestion of uh, Chairman uh, Cogsell when I met with her, her last Friday and uh, with Councillor McLaughlin uh, through the mail slot this morning. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. McGovern. Any other comments? Councillor Emerald. I'd like to have some reaction to those changes from the, the uh, Comprehensive Planning Committee if they'd like to respond. <laughs> I'd like to make one thing clear to the members of the public here that John and I served in the town council a long time together and it's, that really is not animosity that you say. <laughs> the only thing I want to comment on is, is I, oh, <laughs> it is animosity. It is. Um, the only thing I want to comment on is that I guess we're here tonight and you're going to accept the plan and you've softened the words and that may make it easier for the council to deal with it. But I am concerned about the forestry section, which I've never seen before, and the city, the state's mandating that forestry section. I would hope if we have to include that section of uh, about clear cutting trees, forestry, that sort of thing, that the council will move very quickly to check our ordinances to make sure that we have ordinances in place to deal with somebody who reads the comprehensive plan and decides to go out and start clear cutting large pieces of land that are not part of a timber process or something. I am I'm just concerned about it. I don't like it, and I wish it wasn't in there. But if it has to be there, I hope you'll work on the ordinances to go along with it. Does Mr. Butler want to respond to that as to your source of the statements? I'm Steve Butler, town planner. Um, the state has come up with a rather comprehensive list of items that have to be covered in communities' comprehensive plans. Um, two areas that um, Council governments identified might need more looking at were, as my, Mr. McGovern stated, the capital improvement side and the forestry side. As a result of that, uh, it was requested of me that I try and prepare some language on forestry that would try and meet the, uh, the intent and requirements of the state law. And, that's, and so that's what I did with uh, little or no input from the commission or other, or other uh, local boards. So I did what I tried to come up with uh, language that would 
meet the intent of the state law, but also would meet what I thought were some of the cons concerns I've heard or I heard expressed directly or indirectly by the Conference Planning Commission, the Planning Board, and other groups like that. Um, there's no requirement I mean, that's, that that necessarily be tackled this evening. That's something you could add on later on. But the idea was to try and have something uh, presented before you t this evening. We do already have some um, ordinances in place in, real, well, um, in the wetland ordinance that deals with timber harvesting, so that we have something. In you have already. two different areas in your zoning ordinance that deals with timber harvesting. One is the wetlands uh, protection section of the ordinance. The other section is the shoreland zoning section of the zoning ordinance. And that's it for now. I think something that hasn't been stated this evening is also that our comprehensive plan has to go through a review process from a regional government and then by the state. And in order to even submit it for review, we need to have these areas covered in our plan. Yes. Is that correct? Yep. That's a, some, when, before it gets submitted for the regional state review, those should be covered. Madam Council Chairman. Councilman McLaughlin, yes. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Butler. Are you feeling comfortable w with the addition of this section to the plan that we have covered all the state requirements? I didn't want to go through all of them. Mm -hmm. I think for, for the most part, the town of Cape Elizabeth has. I'd like to point out that at this point in time, you're a little bit ahead of schedule. You really don't have to meet the state requirements. Uh, it's unclear as to when, but until at least um, two years from now, a year and a half to two years from now. Um, doesn't mean you can't submit the plan now. The, the, in the state law, the requirements are indeed there. Um, in terms of whether or not it, the, or the conference of plan with the addition of those revisions would meet it, I still think that um, the plan might need a little more background information in terms of what forestry management activities occur now in terms of the background section. But, um, but I think that would, you know, that would be it. I think it would be some very minor fine tuning. I think what the state's going to be looking for primarily is how you address it in your policy and your implementation side. And with these changes, you've hit the two major deficiencies, capital improvements and forestry. Okay, thank you. Other comments or questions of the planner, Council Amaral? Uh, with those two items being so new and not having been uh, available to anyone in the public or to the council until tonight, uh, I would think that we would have to have another public hearing before acting on this. That, that, would, you know, that would be up to the council, I, I would think. I hate to act on anything anyway that I've just gotten tonight and have not had a chance to really uh, review that carefully and to think about and uh, I guess it would be my suggestion, I guess I'll make it in front of the motion, uh, that we set another public hearing at our July meeting to once again review the comprehensive plan with the uh, suggested uh, changes uh, that have been put forward tonight. Second. Discussion? Would that be all right? I know it's a little out of turn. Um, Would you like to go to the podium too? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you have to do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you know, it's like no harm, no foul. I looked at this I mean, the first you're a time. lawyer. You should, you, you should probably be able to answer your own question. However, no, I don't <laughs> know. When, when you're dealing with ordinances uh, and you have a public hearing, uh, well, this is a comprehensive plan, so it's not exactly an ordinance. Uh, I don't know but why you could. We're adding two whole new sections. Yeah, to but this there's one. This, been reviewed before. It's harmless from one one can see, but uh, if, you, if you have a concern about that, take it out of the motion and take it's that up as an amendment to the yes. plan rather than, than, than call upon everybody to sort of come together again on the whole thing. That's, that would just, so much of the rest of this has had so much work in it that mm -hmm. I think everybody would like to see us off to the races. Mm -hmm. So that to the extent that someone wants to have or should have a, a, you know, a chance to look at really a fairly small facet of this, forest management, really, I don't, I, it's hard to imagine it being a big, big issue here in the Cape. But there's one candidate for it, I suppose, that I can think of offhand. Most of you, I think, it's <laughs> probably think of it as well. But um, I would just encourage you really to excise that, which is the only significant change. The rest of these, I hadn't looked at this for a while, um, and I went through it, and it seemed like the rest of them fit and made sense, where you, you didn't want to have an absolute flat-out commitment to doing something within 10 days. You left yourself elbow room. That's appropriate. 
Um, I think Bill here on the scenic views, uh, looking at that, it's the intention of this plan, I think, to try to set up some objective criteria so the people owning land or who are going to own land or plan something have an objective way to feel their way through these, uh, the visual impact. Uh, and that's why there's a technology and a, a, a methodology rather mentioned there. And the other things like are just no harm, no foul. So I just, uh, you know, I'm out of place a little bit. I encourage you not to, to put the whole process off, but to isolate that problem which vexes you most and, and, and address it, because I do believe that it could be considered outside the context of, of holding off on the rest of the plan. This has been done before where we've accepted basically the bulk of something and set for public hearing any new additions. I would withdraw my motion at the second. I'll withdraw the second. Is uh, there? I'll make a new motion. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Try a new That's one. Uh, I would move that the comprehensive plan be adopted uh, with the recommendations suggested tonight, except that the two new areas, one involving capital improvements and the other uh, forestry, uh, be set for public hearing at uh, our July meeting. Second. Discussion? Councilor Jordan? As I understand your motion, we're accepting everything other than those two items. Right. Even though the other items that you've got this evening is new, that you don't feel they have to be reviewed? And uh, I think they're very, they have very slight language changes that uh, in most in well in all instances do not really change the uh, uh, flavor of what it what was recommended in the original plan it just uh, changes the, as far as whether this should be done or shall be done or when it would be done so it's really basically the same uh, making the same point just changing the language slightly and how it'll be accomplished thank you if I may madam chairman ask a question to our able chair and co-chair person of the committee. All right. I would like to get your feelings. Would you come back with some comments on this forestry deal, or do you feel that you would be satisfied the way it's wording? You just kissed me goodbye a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to do that if you would. Would, yeah. would you come back? I mean, yeah. I understand that I Penny know. had some. I know Eleanor Redmond would be happy to work on it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, and this is my. Okay, the deadline for submitting anything is the first of the month for our agenda. Okay, thank you. Councilor McLaughlin. I would like to express my apologies to the rest of the council for making my comments um, on this at such a late date. I know I was not in attendance at the last workshop meeting that was held between the council and the Comprehensive Planning Committee but I have not heard any objections to the comments I put forth from either John or Penny tonight, and if they have any, you know, I'd be glad to entertain them. As Jane said, I don't believe that they are extremely substantive changes that I put forth, and I can say that I'm comfortable with them. I don't know how anybody else feels. Comments? Councilor Kremlin, you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to echo the same thoughts. I, I think in principle, it's not a good idea to get these kind of uh, changes, whether they're syntactical or, or substantial, um, the night of a meeting as we're considering adopting a major um, piece of uh, material that's uh, taken three years uh, to really produce and that our ordinances will, uh, as a consequence, need to uh, be consistent with, uh, for, you know, for further adoption. I've listened to the town manager go over the points and my general feeling is that, uh, that there is a softening of the language and, and uh, less of a forcing individual landowners to comply uh, with the document. That, that's the major thrust that, that I have gleaned from this discussion this evening. Uh, are both, John and Penny, are you both satisfied with these um, new changes because it's a substantial resolution? I mean, we're going to be adopting this and all of these amendments, basically, with the exception of the two that Jane has, has mentioned. We've all listened together at uh, Michael's uh, running through these changes. 
Are, are you both comfortable with, with them being basically a softening of language? See, I, I, I am, but I wouldn't quite characterize it as softening. If you don't wish to adopt a, a, a local housing authority, you don't have to do it. And to make it mandatory here is for you to decide an issue which deserves more debate maybe at another time. The only reason that recommendation is in there is we have some credits that we can keep here in town when some of these reimbursement programs expire under the federal programs if we have a local housing authority in place. It's a good idea. We think you'd, you know, you'd go along with that idea, but why not take it up as a separate item? All it's done here is instead of saying you have to do it, is that it, uh, it puts it on a, on a, on a different uh, road, which is uh, it, it's a good idea to take it up and, and, and do it. Otherwise, someone will read this and say you didn't adopt it, and there's some technical reason for not complying with the plan. So it seems to me that kind of change, and a couple of others fit into the category, if it's only prudent to do this because this avoids some hyper-technical and rather stupid argument at a later time where you've adopted and somebody says, that, you know, for a very minor reason, this whole plan is invalid. So I, it just seems to me it's prudent editing in the thing for the most part. And those things which are policy questions, like forestry management, you excise them and, and take them up. But I, I don't think I would, I don't read this, and I was looking for it, I was looking for the agenda. I was uh, skeptical, as I normally am, and I didn't see anything in here and looking through it tonight that gave me any, any real pause. It just seemed to be some smart colors. Um, Other comments, counselors? Counselor. Question, Madam yes. Chair. Uh, if adopted, uh, and authorized by the state, whatever they approve our plan, can we not make changes to it if we find that something just doesn't go right? Can we not make amendments to it? Yes, we can. We can. It's an ongoing okay. process that we should be sure, reviewing. I mean, like a plan for a house or whatever, changes can be made. Those yes. two have to be approved by the state, yeah. provided that they stay consistent with our overall goal. Right. Okay. Other comments? If not, I'll move the motion. All those in favor of adopting the comprehensive plan as prevented, presented tonight with the amendments on our sheet. All those in favor, raise your hand. Five, six, uh, opposed, one. Thank you for coming. Thank you for doing such an excellent job. Yes. Next item to consider authorizing certain year end transfers between accounts and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, would you explain these for us, please? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, you know, in, at the June meeting, uh, oftentimes we have to come forward, uh, the department heads and myself, but in, I'm the one that usually has to do it, uh, and recommend certain revised appropriations where our appropriation is going to run out uh, by June 30th. Uh, there are uh, one, two, seven different accounts this year. Uh, I'll very briefly explain. The administration full-time payroll uh, it will be overexpended uh, simply because the payroll administrator in the school department, which was formerly a, a town position, uh, had been budgeted formerly in the town budget. It had been uh, in the process of being transferred to the school budget. And lo and behold, we get into the partway through the fiscal year and discovered that neither of us had budgeted the position. Uh, so there's about a $14,000 shortfall that uh, we can't, we couldn't make up during the year to fully fund that position. Uh, the next two are in the area of professional services, and uh, uh, due to legal cost, uh, a lot of activity before the planning board, particularly with the Broad Cove Highlands project, uh, the plan, the administration, and the planning board professional services accounts are both over budget. Uh, for so far this year, in legal fees since July 1, we've spent about $44,000. In engineering fees, which don't totally come out of these two accounts, but uh, come out of uh, that also are for the, the Broad Cove drainage project and the tennis court project, we've spent $76,000 in engineering fees. Uh, for Nomando Associates, uh, some special work uh, for the Davis case as well as for the Broad Cove Highlands. We spent about $6,000 on the primarily wetland studies and for 
the comprehensive plan adoption and for other planning services for the planning board was spent twenty five thousand seven hundred dollars uh, when you add all those up uh, we only had seventy thousand dollars for those two professional services accounts and it ended up we have spent uh, around one hundred twenty thousand for those two uh, the cost of fidelity coverage uh, for all of our employees last year was about $2,250. This year, uh, the premium added up to $8,825. Uh, the Main State Retirement, uh, we had two employees uh, unexpectedly join the system at, at their option as the state law provides. Uh, therefore, that cost was over $6,000. The hydrant rental charges in the Portland Water District went up a little over 40 percent midway through the fiscal year. We did not plan on a 40 percent increase. There's a shortfall there of 5,000. And general assistance cost uh, that had been budgeted at 11,000, currently we've spent about 15,000 and uh, we may take upwards of 16. That, that all adds up to $86,000 in uh, overages. As we look at the other side of the budget savings, uh, we do, we have, uh, identified more than enough areas uh, to provide uh, for a return uh, sufficient to fund all those areas. Uh, for example, just in the, in, the, in the revenue side, the Planning Board Professional Services account, we had $24,505 of subdivision inspection fees above what we had budgeted. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Councilor Reed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. McGovern, would you please explain what happened with the full-time payroll again on the $14,000 shortfall? Yeah, it, um, the payroll administrator uh, was technically still is a town employee. Uh, it's been a confusing uh, area. Initially, the salary was totally funded on the municipal side of the budget. Uh, for a few years, we funded a portion of it in the school department, uh, funded a portion of it. When we were setting up our budget on the municipal side last year, we did not budget it. Uh, we still should have budgeted our share. We did not. Uh, this coming year budget, coming year's budget, it is fully funded in the school budget, as I understand it, in, in a number of different areas within that budget. It was simply an error on my part that it was not included uh, in the uh, administration full-time payroll account for our budget during the current fiscal year. Any other questions? Councilor Jordan. Yes. If I may, Madam Chairman, I'd like to ask the manager. I don't know whether I sh that is an alarming comment or what, but the blanket bond costs have increased due to the requirements from one of our sewer bondholders that we raise our exposure limits. Can you explain that a little bit to me? Is that something to be alarmed about? Or is that just something that uh, goes along as you increase? Well. I'll, I'll try to keep this. One of the uh, Reagan administration's programs uh, was to sell off some of the federal government assets, including bonds. Uh, we, some of our bonds were held by the uh, Farmers Home Administration. Uh, they sold some of the Farmers Home Administration bonds to the General Electric, or GE, Credit Corporation, which later became the, G the GE Capital Corporation. Uh, the GE Capital Corporation has insisted uh, that we uh, increase our limits uh, probably fourfold over, over what they were before as far as our, our coverage for what em embezzlement of you know, whatever employees might do. So it, was, it, was, it came about as a result of the sale of uh, those bonds from Farmers Home Administration to the GE, what is now the Capital Corporation, GECC. Thank you. Mr. Manager, you had put in a formal uh, protest of some sort uh, to the uh, House Majority Leader on this issue, I remember, was it not? I don't remember the House Majority Leader, <laughs> but uh, I remember raising the subject and uh, we, we really didn't get anywhere. Uh, the GE is insistent and when we, re when we read the documentation, it is in fact a requirement that we abide by uh, these certain limits. There's no appeal process. No appeal process. And we did go through a bidding process through our, through our agent to, to get the best deal, and this 8825 is the best we can do. Any other questions? If not, I'll take a motion. 
I would move, Madam Chairman, that we uh, authorize the uh, so described uh, carry uh, forward balances. Second. Uh, this is year end transfers. Year -end. I'm sorry, uh, certain year end transfers. I skipped one over. Is there sorry. A second? Second. Second. Any other discussion? If not all of those in favor, raise your hands, please. It is 7 0. Next item on the agenda to consider authorizing certain year end trans uh, carry forward balances and take any necessary action. Would you also like to give us some background on this, Mr. McGovern? Yes. The these are as a result of uh, really three different, about three different areas. One is a charter requirement which provides that capital projects that are not completed, the uh, funds shall be carried forward. Uh, second, uh, there's a number of them that involve state law. And third, uh, there's a number of them that are simply, I would imagine, council desire to have carried forward. I'll briefly go through them. The street opening account is a state requirement. Uh, the balance as of June 1st was $1,459. The land acquisition fund was June 1, as of June 1, was 194594 That could be reduced by 50000 if uh, the land trust seeks uh, their contribution between now and June 30th. The library copier fund is a, is a sort of like a little enterprise account, and uh, the monies that come in from that eventually go into purchasing a new copier machine. Uh, it's a case of uh, the revenue uh, pays for the supplies in the new copier. The poor farm rental account is uh, the Thomas Jordan Trust, and that's primarily funds received from a lease of the, uh, of the treatment plant site to the Portland Water District. Uh, Gladys Brown, uh, in her estate, a few years ago left us uh, some funds uh, for the planting of trees throughout the town. There's $4,000 left in that account. The road improvement fund, uh, as of June 1st, had 230000 uh, you, you do have, as you can see here below, a lot of obligations for those sun, funds. The Refuse Disposal Equipment Fund, 18855 That's to get going on recycling. Fort Williams Gift Accounts, uh, these are specific gifts that have been received. Inter uh, monetary Gifts, 4173 Library Gifts, a little over 6000 Family Fun Day, since it's so late in the year, uh, it would be the balance as of 630 The Goddard Mansion Stabilization Account, uh, Still has, she's not even listening. <laughs> the Goddard Mansion Stabilization Account has $11,216. And I would expect to receive some professional advice soon on uh, how those funds might be best utilized. The final one is Portland Headlight, $28,000. Uh, as you can see, the descrip description below, this includes $8,000 the town set aside, uh, the Unum's $10,000. Uh, as well as 15000 toward matching the state grant for exterior improvements. Uh, the state, as, as you'll see in a later item, uh, true down, I guess, uh, has given us uh, a $40,000 grant for the restoration of the light. I'm having a, a difficult time now showing where those matching funds are. And uh, this carry forward account is, is, in essence, those continuing funds as well as is a small supplement so that, so that we can match, uh, hopefully match that grant. Uh, fully uh, when the requirement is uh, brought uh, to the town. Questions? Councilor Ma Madam Chair, I'm a question to the manager on that Garden Mansion fund there. How long has that been sitting there like that? It's about three years now. About three years and nothing's been done? Just minor cosmetic uh, items that haven't uh, resulted in any monetary cost. Maybe we ought to take a look at that. I, I, Might be used, you know what I mean, yeah. for a healthy situation. We do have a report that was prepared uh, a couple of years ago on, on the mansion. What I'd like to do is to go down to the mansion uh, with the mansion's chief advocate at some point uh, to <laughs> obtain suggestions on how it might be utilized and then return to the council for a specific authorization. Thank you. Any other anyway. comments for councillors? No, I'll take a motion. Um, uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Excuse me. A question on the Portland headlight money. Where does this 15000 come from? Did it, I miss? It, it in essence, uh, when the financial reports are prepared at the current of the, at the end of the year, uh, it, 
it will essentially be set aside towards this amount instead of lapsing into surplus from other accounts which have not lapsed. Otherwise, uh, a, a greater balance of funds would lapse into surplus. Thank you. Any other comments? Kind of. I'll take a motion on this item, please. Madam Chairman, since I only moments ago jumped <laughs> the gun impulsively on item 11, I would now move that we consider authorizing <coughs> the adoption of these certain carry forward balances. Second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hands, please. 7 0. In favor? Thank you. Next item, item number 12 to consider the annual appointment of a tree warden and taking the necessary action. Very, I'm very pleased to recommend Richard Churchill once again. He, I'd just like to quickly relate to you one story. He's doing such a great job that I was speaking with Wendy Derzowitz, the editor of the Cape Cory the other day, and she told me she had three separate pictures of Rick Churchill uh, at different tree planting ceremonies uh, over the last few months. So uh, he is doing a great job and certainly merits uh, reappointment. Councilor McCaughlin. Madam Chairman, I would like to move that we appoint Richard Churchill as tree warden for the ensuing year. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand, please. 7-0. Item number 13, to consider authorizing the town manager to sign a letter of agreement with the Maine Historical Preservation Commission relating to the $40,000 grant for the restoration of the Portland Headlight Keeper's Quarters and take any necessary action. Background, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, as we're very pleased to receive a grant of $40,000 uh, through the Maine Historic Preservation Commission uh, from the National Lighthouse Bicentennial Fund, uh, the funds would go toward the uh, <coughs> improvements of the Portland Headlight Keeper's Quarters. Uh, you have before you a, uh, a proposed letter of agreement as well as a uh, certificate certification regarding debarment, suspension, ineligibility, and voluntary exclusion of lower tier covered <coughs> transactions, typical federal government legalese. Uh, what, what I would like to mention is uh, thanks to uh, Henry Adams, our coordinator, uh, the Portland Headlight Keepers Quarters Building Committee, the architects, uh, Richard Renner and uh, Samuel Van Dam, as well as Earl Shettleworth and Roger Reed of the uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission and all the folks of the United States Coast Guard were making pretty good progress uh, on the lighthouse and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Councilor Jordan. Oh, you thought I wanted to say something? I was going to make a motion that we authorize a manager to sign the agreement. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Madam Chairman, I have a question before we go to a vote on this. Are we expecting to receive the full $40,000 on this? Yes. We are. I'm just concerned with all the state cutbacks and such. I want to make sure that's the, what we're yeah. going to look for. These are actually federal it's funds. It's federal that, funds. Yeah. Well, <laughs> things See. get watered down. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> You're expecting Any other questions or comments? If not, I'll move the motion. All those in favor? Seven zero. Next item on the agenda, item number 14, to consider authorizing fundraising for the school department and take any necessary action. I must say there was really nothing in our packet explaining that, giving us additional background on this. Um, Madam Chairman, I'm sorry about that. It was delivered to me late. Um, manager was very nice to give us the uh, advice we needed as terms of the uh, the state sections of the code that we could use um, tonight in explaining the situation and they are uh, in front of everyone in a folded packet I'll make sure that won't happen again we have a letter here from mr. William Bremer um, is there Anyone who wants to give us a little more background? Mr. Bremer is here. Bremer. Here's the point where I'll need more space up here to shovel all the papers. Uh, 
since you have the, the packet uh, of what I prepared to say, uh, uh, what I prepared to say here today, uh, I will go over it very briefly. In fact, I'll read it, but rather rapidly, just for the sake of the audience who don't have, who doesn't have the, the uh, information, and then be prepared to answer any questions on it. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the Town Council, my name is William Brummer, and I live on Little John Road. I'm here tonight on behalf of a group of concerned citizens, parents, teachers, citizens, and students who are currently soliciting pledges in order to retain the various programs cut in the 1990-91 approved school budget. I'm here to request a permit from the Town Council so that we may continue to obtain pledges and donations in the name of the Town of Cape Elizabeth in order to restore these program cuts. As I stated in my letter to the editor, published in the Cape Courier on June 2nd, which you have before you, the school board has informally agreed to reinstate the programs in full if the $51,000 can be raised through this voluntary fundraising effort. Your approval of this request for a permit is crucial for the following reasons. Townspeople will be assured that the monies will be properly gathered, accounted for, and used to fund the cut programs, or that they will be returned to the donors. Two, the school board will be satisfied that it can accept and use these monies to fund the cut programs. Without your approval, it is doubtful that the school board will be willing or able to accept the monies to fund the programs. Uh, that is based on a telephone conversation I heard earlier today with the uh, immediate past chairman of the school board. Uh, three, the Family Fund Day Committee will be more comfortable with allowing Jane Ellis, myself, and others to set up a food sales and information booth at Family Fund Day next Saturday in which we plan to solicit pledges, provide information on the cut programs, sell food pre prepared using home economics recipes, and, weather permitting, offering free rides in my antique automobile to anyone pledging $100 or more. We do what we can, as it were. A member of the committee with whom uh, I spoke today was concerned that this pledge effort was too political to be part of Family Fund Day, given the council's directive to the committee, and was, and was frankly reluctant to uh, guarantee space. Uh, would feel much more comfortable with your approval. Uh, the events of the past few months have been extraordinary. Few believe that the school board would not find a way to retain the programs. Many believe that a way will still be found and that it will be found at the school board meeting tomorrow evening. I am somewhat less, less optimistic. Without dwelling on the dismay and outrage that the school board program cuts and the lack of a public hearing have caused, this fundraising effort appears to be the only avenue left to concerned parents, students, and teachers in the town. These may be difficult economic times, but the future of our uh, children, their ability be, to be productive and competitive in the future world economy, argue strongly that this is not the time to cut programs. Rather, it is the time to strengthen broad educational programs and to encourage parental involvement and activity on behalf of their children's education. Uh, I will I'm going to digress briefly from the prepared remarks to uh, summarize something that I saw that was provided me actually that appeared in the uh, Portland Maine Press Herald, Herald Saturday, June 9, 1990, that refers to a, a report from the State Commission on the Common Core of Learning. And that basically notes, among other things, and I appreciate that citing from a newspaper article can be, can be viewed as taking something out of context, and I certainly don't mean to do that. Uh, but I would just read very briefly. The newest draft report from the commission recommends that all students have a firm education in English and language arts, fine arts, a foreign language, growth and human development, science and technology, mathematics, social studies, and applied technology and occupational education. I believe the kinds of programs that are uh, being cut this year and are certainly on the uh, drawing on the board next year to consider being cut are those occupational learning courses, even obviously in a middle school. Uh, some way away from occupation, but still a, a good fundamental uh, uh, program for that. What has astonished me personally in this effort is that many parents, teachers, members of the town council, and the school board all want the programs retained, but that amazingly nothing can be done unless it is be done by this grassroots effort. Uh, given the sentiment that I have personally witnessed and the $16,000 in pledges that have been raised to date through a more or less informal campaign and without formal support from the town or the school board, it must be clear that there is serious citizen support to retain these programs. Some of you on the council and others in the community, including the editor of the Evening Express, believe that this fundraising effort is inappropriate. I must disagree. I believe that we need the 1991 
1990-91 school year to debate the value of the various living skills programs such as home economics and industrial arts. I myself have become an ardent support, supporter of these programs because I've seen how much how, much, how they have enriched my older son's education. Let me assure you, however, that this effort is not going to be an annual event. I do not intend to do this again. And as you consider this unusual request, please contemplate how many communities in the country are currently faced with a grassroots effort to raise money to prevent the, de the, de the decline of quality education. Therefore, I am requesting that the Town Council issue a permit running from June 15th to September 14th or such other ending date as is acceptable to the Council to allow the group of concerned parents to solicit the pledges and donations uh, to provide funding for these programs. Thank you. Certainly attempt to answer any questions. Uh, and there may not be yes. Councilor Kramer. Mr. Bremer, um, in your second uh, uh, paragraph here, no, I'm not sure where it was. Anyway, you, you, uh, you mentioned that the school board has informally um, agreed to reinstate the programs in full if the $51,000 can be raised through the uh, voluntary fundraising effort. There's a lot of misinformation about this particular issue, about the, um, the informal agreement. Can you be a little clearer about this? I'd, I'd be glad to explain it as I understand it. In various uh, phone, telephone conversations with then Chairman Loretta, Loretta Pond, I asked whether an inf a grassroots effort of this nature would be able, if you will, to generate funds that would be accepted by the school department. Uh, Mrs. Pond was kind enough to uh, poll the other members of the school board and uh, they agreed unanimously that they would accept the funds for this purpose if they were raised. Uh, I will ask them tomorrow night uh, to formally, to, to formalize that informal understanding. However, I think they're waiting, I shouldn't say they're waiting, I think they would be more comfortable with formalizing their position if the town council were willing to grant the permit. So, so basically, uh, Mrs. Pond uh, called the other four members of the school board and um, in speaking for all five, said that if the $51,000 was raised, they, the school board would accept the money and basically, um, eliminate the past round of cuts. That is correct. That, that, I don't even have the exact date that that telephone conversation occurred. It was sometime prior to June 2nd because it is the <coughs> basis of my uh, statement in the letter that the school department had agreed to reinstate the, the programs but not the funding. And uh, uh, I confirmed that again today, this earlier today with uh, uh, Mrs. Pond, but I want to just emphasize that that was an informal agreement and our understanding and uh, we certainly wish to go forward with formalizing that. Any other questions of Mr. Bremer? Uh, Councillor Reed. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I will bring to the Council's attention that there are two school board members in the room. Uh, also, I uh, met with Loretta Pond and Peter Leslie and have the same uh, impression as uh, Mr. Brummer that if we could raise the funding, the programs would be uh, reinstated. I would ha like to clarify, however, that only 50, uh, excuse me, of the 51,000, only $35,900 needs to be guaranteed, which is a cost of the salary of a teacher. The other programs are in effect, and we would simply add to the money that is used for those in force programs. Co curricular, sports, and K2 integrated arts were cut a percentage, not entirely. The only program cut entirely was the home economics course, living Does skills. 35000 include the special benefits that would have to go? $35,900 is her salary. Her fringe benefits were never cut when her salary was. Comments from other counselors? <coughs> Nobody wants to say anything? Well. Councilor Jordan. I got a, I got a little speech here. 
No, I just, I just want to say that I'm not too much in favor of this uh, idea, or way of raising funds for a school program. I also want to say that I know the school board and they've put in a lot of long, hard hours. They've worked hard as far as the budget goes. And a lot of this difference in opinion is they're thinking against my thinking or your thinking and what have you. But I am really disappointed after all the work that they've done. And I think that we worked on it at the budget hearing. There were two votes against approving the budget. That there was a couple of us who was concerned that what would happen is just what has happened here now. And I would hope that between the, before it went this far, that the town council and the school board could have got together and, and worked this out some way or another, regardless whether the town municipal side had to do away with paving a street or doing some maintenance work for another year and let them ride over the bumps and what have you for another year to fund this program the way I feel is to be properly done. Now, I know they had a 14% increase in their budget. And you can sit here and figure it out and feel that there should have been funds enough there to, reinstate, to continue this program of Home Act. And I've never had so many calls since I've been on the council the last few years that I've had on this issue right here. And uh, people are in a sense, are getting divided within this town because of the way we're going about this funding and why they should have to do it. As I get a call today from a lady, and I'm very concerned. She has three s students in the school system, eighth grade, sixth grade, and I believe it was a third grade. And they come home with a paper saying that she had to come up with 200 and some dollars. Well, she didn't know they both work, where they was going to come with that 200 and some dollars. But the kids say, and this is the part that bothers me, gee, Mom, if you don't do it, we're not going to be liked in school. And to me, this is no way to fund school programs and to have this going on within the system. And uh, I feel that maybe we should take and sit down and see if we can't work this out one way or another and hit it, hit it full, on, full forward and not keep getting bits and pieces of what's going on of this money's here and that money's there. And let's go at it like you might say uh, professional people and the two boards get together and find out if something could be done. I am going to a vote in favor of them raising the funds in hope that they can uh, get together the two boards and see if we can't come up with a solution to this problem. And uh, I have a couple of things that, that bother me and, and I think we've got to meet with the school board and fathom this out. I heard when I come back on this council about the one town concept. I can't in the life of me in the last few years see any one town concept. We, we settle with our municipal employees with a 5% increase. They come in with a 7 We had a meeting here a year ago, and the board, the two committees, representative from the two boards agreed that when you get into salaries discussion, there was going to be some feedback back and forth. Well, I don't feel that has happened. And uh, I'm very concerned about that, and I think, and I see the two members right out here, and I hope they'll carry it back to the others, that I know they work damn hard and they do a lot of work, but I think they should meet this head on and let's get away from this bickering back and forth of a little bit here and a little bit there and see if we can't solve this prog program. The deficit, maybe I should say the deficit, so it'd be all the program because uh, like I say, I'll support the fundraising to keep the thing going and see if we can't clear the thing up. Thank you. Are there any other people from the public who would like to make a brief comment? <clears throat> would you come forward, please?
Madam Chairman and members of the Council and citizens, my name is Penny Carson and I have been sort of just reading about this issue in the newspaper and hearing about it in the news for the last few weeks. I have no opinion here about any council decisions, nor did I follow it that closely. I have no opinion about any school board decisions or how it was made. I didn't follow it that closely. I have no opinion about any teachers, any specific teachers that are involved, or any specific programs or the character of any programs. But I am stunned and appalled at the message that we have been giving to our children. This year, especially, we see nations tumbling all around us trying to get what we've got a democracy. We elect fellow citizens to represent us in a representational form of government. They represent us by acting on the laws and other matters that affect us. This is what makes us a democracy. Other people don't have that opportunity, or not all. It seems that in the beginning, as I was reading, the proper process was taken. Members who wanted this program went to the school board, went to the council, tried to persuade them through their point of view and they did that, and that was the proper method to take. However, obviously, the school board and or the council had a lot of other points to consider in their deliberations, and they did not agree with what this group of people wanted. The group lost. So what did the group do? It gathered its children together and its friends and decided what they really needed to solve this problem was money, because we live in a very affluent community, and money solves everything. Money will fix it. Don't worry, kids. We'll get some money, and money's going to fix it. Let's be sure to get all the children involved. Imagine having children in the school come home, bringing a note asking for money in a public education system like this. Imagine one of my neighbors calling me up and saying that her fifth grade daughter was solicited by another fifth grade child. You have to bring money. You have to bring money. I was absolutely stunned. I thought, what kind of a lesson is this are we giving our children in a democratic process? Are we teaching them to deal with the issue the way we're supposed to deal with it? The lesson has been, we lost, we couldn't persuade them, so we'll find another way, and that way is money. Get the kids out earning money. The children have been led by the adults. They are doing active and fun things to raise money for this purpose. They are following the direction and lead of their parents. They're working toward an education by car wash. And I said to myself, how could this possibly be happening in this town, in, in my town? I've lived in this town all my life, and I support public education. My children are grown. They are no longer in school. But I do not support public education by private special interest funds. This is a public school. Now, money's been raised with the idea that the program will be reinstated. There's been no public vote by public monies. There'd been no public vote on what actually will be done with this money or what can be done. The money first must be accepted into the general fund. I called up the town manager told him to buy a lawnmower with it. Maybe we need a lawnmower. Maybe we cut a lawnmower. Maybe we cut a fire engine. Maybe we cut firemen's boots, firemen's hats, safety issues. Maybe we did. I don't know. Who will control this money? If this money is raised, who will control the money? How is the money to be used? Well, I have a list of things I just, I'm sorry, I left one piece of paper. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Will the people who put the money in then want to control the teachers and the program that they put that money in for? Who will decide the curriculum? What happens if, if the money is reinstated, the curriculum goes in, the teacher goes in, or a teacher goes in, and the parents don't like what they, what's taught in that course? So you say, wait a minute, I raised the money for that teacher's salary. That's our course. I'm going up there because I don't like what's being in that course. That's not public free education. When I pay, I want input. I want to know what's going to happen, and I think some other people may want input. This is really becomes a special interest group. You'll not be working the way that we are supposed to be working for a free public education. You are working the way private, independent school education works. If you want this program and you want your children to have it, then raise the money and have it as an extracurricular activity. 
That's the way other things, hockey boosters, other things have done when they want extracurricular. And if you have your program at 3 or 3.15 in the afternoon, whatever the program is, is, just see how many children really will come if it's that important to them. I think what I'm trying to say is, this is sort of my Thomas Jefferson speech, how many of the people who are concerned about what the school board or the town council did voted for those town council members and or those school boards. Did you discuss with your children, gee, there's a town election coming up. Let's decide who agrees with our point of view. Look, children, this is the way it works. You talk about candidates and you talk about their reasons to decide whether to vote for them. <coughs> Did anybody have that discussion? You didn't say, I'm going to raise a little money so I can get the candidate I want. That's not the way it works. It is a free public system. We have a vote tomorrow. I hope you've all discussed it. I hope everybody's discussed it with their children, who to vote for, for tomorrow's election. The other thing that disturbed me about this, and I, and I re remember during the campaign that Mrs. Reed spoke so strongly about wanting to be on the school board, but because there was two incumbents running for the school board, she said, oh well, and I heard this, I will guess I'll go for the town council because there's nobody running against anybody there. There's just two openings and there's two people running me and somebody else. What a tremendous disservice that Mrs. Reed has done to herself, if her major interest is the school board, and a tremendous disservice to the citizens of this community, because it's going to be very boring on the town council, because there's nothing that comes up about schools until budget time. You're going to be talking about hoppers and trucks, fire engines, hoses, ordinances, and none of it's going to be very interesting if you really want to be on the school board. You know, this is the, and I just, I felt so strongly about this because here we are in a small New England town, in a state in New England, the seat of democracy is the sons of liberty and all that, and we're screwing up the system. I don't think this is intended. The school budget is going to be twice as difficult next year as it is this year, for not just this town, but every town. Who is going to raise the funds for the school for this program next year? Or is it only important to these children and not important to future children? If the program is that important, you should worry about it for the future years, because after your kids get out of the program, if it's that important, it should be good for the rest of the children. How are you going to guarantee, unless you work through the representative form of government, that the programs you want are there? I really want to take this opportunity to, to remind people that this is a chance to teach the basic values of American democracy. Basics are not just the three R's, the basic values of what we've got in this country and what other countries don't have. I don't think Thomas Jefferson had this in mind when he talked about free public education for everybody. I'd like to urge the parents to rethink this, to teach their children that money is not the solution, it's a Band-Aid solution and it is not the solution to this, and to use their opportunities to teach them about the democratic process and that our town abides by it. again, still nervous. First of all, it's a shame that we have to do what we want to do. I mean, I didn't feel as though when I moved to Cape that I'd have to pay for a piece of my child's education. I have four boys in the school system, sixth grade, two third grades, and a second grader. And I feel as though the program is well needed, not because I think if it was any teacher in that position, I would still want the program. Jane is a spectacular teacher. She gives the kids what they need, and they all like her. And if I, I'm putting money up for it, I'm not going to tell Jane how to teach her a job. Jane got the education. She knows what to teach those kids. And my children come home and tell me what they've learned. And granted, we learn a lot at home, but I think the program is well needed. And it's a shame that we have to stand in front of the board and ask for the right to donate the money to save the program. It just should be done between the town council and the school board. The money was put in the budget for the portable, and that was, it was there because to save home ec. That was where we were going to room the new home ec because we were short on space. So many things I want to say and I can't get them all out. But that's my GP purpose is, you know, I think if we want to stand up and do it, then give us that, that right. And I'm not telling my children, gee, we can buy, we can buy Mrs. Ellis's job because we like her. That's not what I'm doing. 
on buying a way into the system to save that teacher because it's needed in our school department. And I haven't discussed with my children how much money mommy and daddy are putting up. Maybe we can't afford to put up a lot of money, but I'll put up what I can afford and I'll do it the year, the next year and the year after if I have to. But there's a problem with the school board. The money's got to be there someplace. I mean, it's just, we're going to go through this every year, every single year. And my next comment is, I believe in Rosemary. And, and she stood up for what she believed in. And a lot of us wanted to, but we didn't, as you can tell how nervous I am. I couldn't get up and do. And when I grow up, I want to be just like her. Thank you. <laughs> I guess this person back here had their hand up first. Well, here I go again. My name is Sherry Gower, and I'm not really a public speaker, but um, Ms. Parson, she has a point. However, I, have been in, I work in the school system. I have two children in the school system, and she's telling us that we shouldn't raise money and tell our children. Ch children are coming home and saying, if I'm not, don't pay this money, I'm not accepted. What happens when this year they had a night theme and my child said, I have to have a $13 t-shirt. I've had to pay for a certain book because an author is coming that's maybe $15. I've had to pay out money for umpteen items because my child is not going to fit in unless he buys this t-shirt or this book or these spices or these something. To me, that fits in the same category as this program. I would much rather put my money into a program like this with a good teacher. All we're asking for is $35,000 to keep her job. We have a program that we put $100,000 a year in. And if anybody is interested, I'd like to know how much it costs per child in integrated arts, and I will take my, both of my children out of that program and donate the money to the home economics program. Because I think they learn more in that program than they do in integrated arts. We are bringing in, in Cape Days, bands, and symphonies and all these things, and this is what they say to me. We have to have integrated art so our children can see the symphony, they can see these artists, they can see these things. They're wonderful. However, it's a double system. We're bringing them in to Cape Days and all the children are going to be there. Why do we have to pay for them twice? I still say the money, and I can't afford it, but I will give as much money as I can and probably more than I can to keep this program in the schools. There's a gentleman over here who had his hand up. My name is Bob Anastasov. Um, I am one of the parents that uh, pledged an amount to uh, the school system uh, in getting the, this, uh, these uh, programs reinstated. Um, it's no special interest on my part. I won't have a child going into home ec program probably for the next, uh, oh, seven years. What I did was I put in a certain amount of money, I pledged a certain amount of money to do exactly what Mr. Jordan suggested tonight. And that is in the hopes that both boards will work as professionals. If you now kill that program, I'm, I shouldn't say, you know, the town council. If the, the, that program is killed, it will never be reinstated again. And I'm saying uh, let the uh, uh, parents who are willing to, to pay for the program. I mean, we'll, I, I found some, some comments made uh, completely alarming by this individual who purports to uh, represent the comprehensive plan. Uh, if you notice, the school system came fifth, taxes came ninth. Here we are, you know, we're the parents. We do want the, the programs to continue. We're willing to uh, uh, fund the program until both boards can get together. And I think Mr. Jordan, acting in a, in a professional manner, as he mentioned tonight, working with the school board, will come to a conclusion where uh, these uh, activities will, will remain in the system. And parents like myself, who did come to Cape Elizabeth specifically for the school system, there's nothing else over here in terms of industry or anything like that to attract me. Uh, we're hoping that uh, both of you will work together to, to solve the problem. And again, uh, hope next year that uh, we won't have to put in some more money to, uh, you know, in the same situation. It's just a, 
a band-aid approach right now. Thank you. My name is Henry Adams. I live on Todd Road. Uh, I was not going to say anything tonight, but after Penny's Thomas Jefferson speech, I feel obliged to make a couple of remarks. There were five intelligent people on the school board. There were seven intelligent people on the town council. They made their decisions, and I think those decisions should rest. The business of raising funds is highly inappropriate, and especially uh, raising funds at Family Fund Day. I was the first chairman of Family Fund Day when we developed the philosophy, along with Jane Amro, we were co-chairman. When we developed the philosophy of Family Fund Day, this was to be a fun time. And to drag a political issue into Family Fund Day is highly inappropriate. I would urge that the council vote not to allow this procedure to take place. Is there anyone else? My name is Fran Haywood, and I just want to make a short comment about the proposal uh, for a group of parents to raise money uh, to reinstate a particular program or several programs into the school system. Um, I guess I feel it would be a very, very unfortunate precedent to set to have a special interest group. The, there are many of my friends who believe strongly in reinstating the home ec program particularly and expanding the other programs which have been cut back. I know that their intentions are very, very well-meaning. I admire their enthusiasm and their dedication to working hard for what they want in the school system. But I, as a citizen, as a parent, feel that I voted for the people who are on the school board to make the decisions knowing all the facts, the pros and cons, the priorities that have to be set, the sometimes very difficult, as I'm sure you know, very, very difficult decisions that have to be made when money is not limitless. And I really object to the idea of a group of parents coming to the school system and saying, we will provide the money, but you must do this and provide this program for not only my child, but for other children. I think that's grossly inappropriate. And it's not that I think, it's, it's not a comment about the program, it's not a comment about the people who are working hard for that end, but I think it's an extremely inappropriate way to go about making decisions about the priorities that need to be set in a school system. I have elected the uh, five school board members to make the best decisions about how to prepare my children and the rest of our students for their life in basically the next century. And um, if I don't like the decisions they make or don't like enough of them, I think in the next election I will vote against them and vote for somebody who makes decisions more to my liking. And I think other people have the same option. I would urge you to not allow this. I, I think it's a very unfortunate precedent to set for this town. Thank you. Is there anyone else? 